Welcome to PMP Live. My name is Michelle and I'm a bookseller with our children and teen department. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are so excited to hear from two amazing author duos with Tiffany Drayton moderating. Tonight we are highlighting World in Between by Kenan Trebnitsevic and Susan Shapiro and A Place at the Table by Sonia Faruqi and Laura Chauvin. And both are excellent reads. So we're gonna drop the links for purchasing the books into the chat box. So if you don't already own a copy, definitely reserve yours today. You can also check out our website for more great books by the authors. And tonight you can ask the authors questions by clicking Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. You can also vote on your favorite questions. And at the end, we'll have time to go over some together. And as always, please remember, this is a creative, safe space, and we ask the folks to be respectful of one another and any questions and comments. Now, on to tonight's event. It is my pleasure to introduce celebrated authors, Tiffany Drayton, our moderator, and Kenan Trebnicevic, Susan Shapiro, Sadia Faruqi, and Laura Chauvin. Kenan is a Bosnian Muslim who survived the ethnic cleansing in the Bosnian War and came to America in 1993. He's a physical therapist who lives in Manhattan with his wife. He's written for many publications, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Esquire. He is the co-author of the adult memoir, The Bosnia List, with Susan Shabiro, and now we're launching their new critically acclaimed middle grade novel, World in Between. In it, we follow the story of 11-year-old Kenan, who goes from playing soccer in a happy, comfortable life to dodging bullets and ever grimmer journey of escape as his home deteriorates around him. Moving and Raw is a story of family, restarting, and those you meet along the way. Susan Shapiro grew up in Michigan. She's an award-winning new school professor and Jewish journalist who freelances for many publications, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Wired, and New Yorker Magazine. She lives in Manhattan with her husband, and she's the best-selling author of several books her family hates, including the popular writing guide, Byline Bible, and her recent memoir, The Forgiveness Tour. Sadia Faruqi is originally from Karachi and moved to the U.S. in 1998. After 9-11, she began writing about Islam for a local Texas newspaper to combat Muslim stereotypes. She's the author of the beloved Yasmin Siri Early Reader series, which follows a Pakistani-American girl and her adventures, and the upcoming middle grade novel, Yusuf Asim is Not a Hero. She lives with her husband and children in Houston, where she is editor-in-chief of Blue Marinette, a magazine for Muslim art, poetry, and prose. Laura Chauvin grew up Jewish and half British in New Jersey. She's a Pushcart Prize nominated poet with three poetry collections out and the author of two award-winning middle grade novels, The Last Fifth Grade of Emerson Elementary and Takedown. She now lives with her family in Maryland where she is a longtime poet in the schools for the Maryland State Arts Council. She and Sadia are co-authors of the celebrated middle grade novel, a place at the table. And it, we find a delightful tale of friendship and family and food as Sarah and Elizabeth began to connect during an after-school cooking club. Sweet and relatable, it also addresses the deep subjects of racism, depression, and immigration. Tonight, we are happy to have Tiffany Dray Drayton moderating our discussion with the authors. A writer herself, Tiffany is also an activist and a mother of two, now based in Trinidad. After graduating from a new school in New York, she's written about race, feminism, and gentrification from the New York Times, Marie Claire, Salon, and Yahoo, among other outlets. Her debut memoir, Black American Refugee, comes out next year. And now I'm excited to turn it over to Tiffany and our authors. Thank you for joining us, guys. Can I, can I cheer for us? Yay! Yay. I like sharing. Um, <laughs> This is such a pleasure to be able to host this event. And these two books are absolutely wonderful. Um, as a woman of color who was raised reading young adult books, um, I've always sought books that reflected the immigrant experience and, and stories of people of color. And so now we are here to discuss World in Between and A Place at the Table. And both of these books are just truly phenomenal. And I say that from the depths of my soul. Um, Kenan and Susan, World in Between, really delves into this really heartbreaking story that's just, wow, uh, to see this boy kind of traverse such hardship, but to do so through the lens of a young person and to give us those insights, it's, it's a wonderful take. And Sadia and Laura, a place at the table is hilarious. <laughs> I just absolutely love them, these two books. So 
the first question that I, it's been burning for me to ask, I'm very, very curious. Are these books based on true stories or your own stories? What do you want to so, say? Sadia, would you like to go, Kenan? Anybody? Yeah. Kenan, why don't you go? Uh, well, this particular book started uh, with an essay Newsweek in 2016 against muzzle ban, a uh, travel ban, uh, which contains certain countries and also uh, the refugees. And in the piece, uh, I mentioned what I was feeling when I was 11 years old, uh, watching the war unfold and seeing neighbors, friends, and um, my coach and the teacher um, turn on me. Um, also, I mentioned in the piece how um, Americans of all different backgrounds banded together, and it was the Westport Connecticut Interfaith Council or churches and synagogues who sponsored uh, my family. And Susan actually uh, put this essay on her uh, Facebook once it was published, and one of her former students, uh, children's editor, said to Susan, I think this will make a great middle grade book to teach Americans how to treat immigrants, be kind, not fearful of immigrants, and helping them ways to assimilate. So Susan reached out to uh, Wendy Wolf, our adult memoir uh, editor from Penguin, and Wendy didn't want this book to um, step on the Bosnia list and interfere with the audience. And that was the high school and college audience because the book is used in uh, those curriculums. So she, she, she suggested for us to write a middle grade a novel based on um, the true story. So it's a fictionalized biography you know, based on a true story. So it, started out, it started out as a memoir, middle grade memoir. And then as we kept going, um, it was really hard to condense everything and get like 100 years of Yugoslavian history and there were too many characters. So um, it turned out we have a great editor, Lynn Paulino, who had published a book um, that was uh, uh, funny, and, funny and Farsi that uh, was an adult book that was also turned into a kid's book called It Ain't So Awful Falafel. And they had, it started out as an adult memoir, but then wound up a middle grade novel. So we used that as a, as a way to tell the story. And that gave us a little bit more leeway. And also it made it much more different than the adult memoir. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And how about um, Laura and Sadia? Lauren? Yeah, I actually, uh, um, It Ain't So Awful Falafel is one of my favorite books. So I did not know it started out as uh, something for adults. Um, makes sense. Uh, our book, A Place at the Table, is definitely fictional. But there are so many experiences that both the main characters and their moms and their families face that are um, inspired by our own lives. So um, uh, Sarah, the main character that I wrote, as um, her family is from Pakistan, just like my family. And so um, a lot of characters are kind of people I know, or maybe even myself. And then um, for Laura, it's the same. Uh, she can speak more about that, but um, definitely fictional. It's so much more fun to make up fictional stuff. Yeah, I, I, the reason I approached Sadia with this story idea is I grew up um, first generation American on one side. <laughs> And I really like what Kenan said about um, writing these books to help kids and adults understand the immigrant experience and how that affects kids. I think that in my own family, um, you know, my mom came to the United States uh, because she fell in love with my dad. That's a whole different story. But it, you know, my, my family doesn't have the, the refugee experience and, and they didn't have to leave uh, the country of origin. And yet some of the same stresses um, that Kenan describes and Susan describes in this book are stresses that my family experienced and that Sadia and I have spoken about, like the, you know, the mental health issues that my mom suffered from because of leaving her whole family and community behind. Um, the financial stressors that happen when, you know, when people come to this country, even if they're coming for positive reasons, um, sometimes adults, um, I think it's mentioned in the book that that uh, Sarah's mom had uh, studied psychology and had a, you know, had like a master's degree. And here she is, she's catering because her degree hasn't transferred. So it was important to us to show that 
um, even a positive immigrant experience comes with a lot of stressors on kids um, because when I was growing up, it just wasn't a- addressed. And yet it was a big, big part of my experience of being an elementary and middle schooler. Yeah, just to add something, one of the things that a lot of people caught with Kenan's book is that there was this sense after that his family escaped the war and they came to America and they were safe. And there was this sense, now you're okay. But it turns out they weren't okay for a lot of years. Kenan, do you want to maybe mention some of the things that you guys had to go through once you got here? When we moved so many times, and mom uh, found out that she had breast cancer, like three mm. months uh, while we in America. And then my dad was sick, he ended up getting a stroke, uh, losing jobs, finding new jobs. So I think we moved four or five times in, in three years. So it was really hard to get adjusted and meet friends and come comfortable. But luckily, I had you know strangers of different backgrounds who were always sensitive uh, and understand my past. So that's another message of the book: is family resilience, kindness, and strangers' uh, support and a strong community, which helped us become successful and um, model citizens. Yeah. That's that's really um, in the story. I think I really really connected with your character, and we were able to see. Um, the experience of, of, of going from a normal life to a life full of tumult, we experienced it through the lens of the character, which is yourself as a young boy, and it was a really phenomenal experience. And also, uh, Sarah in World, I mean, in A Seat at the Table, she was just such a strong character that, uh, Sadia, if you're the person who wrote her, I refuse to say, I will not accept that she's not a real person, because that happens <laughs> to a real, real person. I don't care what you say, but she fine, is- I will accept I will yeah. accept. I will accept you saying it's fictional. Um, but kind that- of grumpy, kind of, kind of. Um, well, I would say that all our my characters are definitely inspired by real people. Mm. Uh, mostly my kids, because I came here to the U.S. as an adult, so I did not have the same experiences of growing up and going to school here. Uh, but my kids are first generation. They have been born. They were born here. They're grown up being. Muslim American slash brown slash first generation, so many identities that are hard um, to navigate in a post 9-11 world, which is um, uh, even harder than, you know, um, uh, being that in a in, in a different time period. So I definitely, um, Sarah is basically a combination of both my children. I have a son and a daughter and all their um, issues and their problems, but also their talents and their good qualities are all kind of combined <laughs> together in, in Zara. You, you um, actually answered the question that I was going to ask. Gary. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. You're reading my mind. Oh, good question. Uh, which was, I, I really wanted to know what the writing process was like, um, not only in creating these characters that are just truly, um, you really feel them. You really, they feel like whole entire beings. So not only in creating the characters, but also having two authors. um, I I really, I'm curious about what that experience was like. It's such a fascinating topic. And Sadia and I have talked to, or, you know, done uh, events with, or, or been interviewed with a lot of different author pairs. It feels like everybody has a different process um, that works for them. And I'm curious about Kenan and Susan's process because, you know, Sadia and I, each wrote our own character. And even though we we sort of alternated chapters and we planned all of that out and we were giving each other feedback as we went along, you know, we each um, are very much sort of in charge of the one character. So I'm curious to hear how it was for the world in between. Susan always stressed out that God is in details and show don't tell. And another thing I learned was that just because something happened doesn't mean it's important. So there's so many different ways that we communicated, be- being that I had a full-time job uh, as a physical therapist. So I would send pages to her. She would call me over the phone, interview me. She would send back me the page and ask me, does this sound right? Is this your voice? And over time, she really learned um, t- to get into my head and learn the voice. So at some point mm-hmm. in time, she-, she sounded like me with the, you know, with the <laughs> grant. <laughs> well, I'll tell the funny story, which is that when I first met him, so he's my physical therapist and he was very... A uh, man, a few words, um, not emotional. Um, when I started asking him about his past, he did not want to talk about it at all. And at one point, I tried to get him to write a flashback scene about his past. And by the way, so I'm a middle-aged Jewish female memoirist and shrinkaholic who started out as a confessional poet 
And my, one, my favorite professor, the biggest insult he, he would say is there's no blood here. And my shrink used to say, lead the least secretive life you can. And then Kenan <laughs> is younger and male and never, never talks about anything. So slowly I got him to open up. But at one point I said, would you write a flashback scene about your childhood? So he said, no. He said, I can't remember. <laughs> he said, I can't remember anything. I keep to my chest. No, he said, no. But so then um, I think I sent him a piece that a student had written and oh, and he sent a piece to the New York Times that they were interested in. So, so then the next day when I go to my physical therapy, he rushes up to me and he helps me and he, I'm laying on a table and he puts electrodes in my back and I'm laying flat and he hands me 43 pages of the flashback scene that he's written the night before. And he's pointing, he's like, what did you think of this? What did you think of that? So remember, I thought in one week I have turned my mellow Muslim physical therapist into a neurotic Jewish freelance writer like me. <laughs> And so but it, was, it was like this really it. funny, like wow. uh, osmosis or something. And then he was, and then he would just write pages and pages. And he happened luckily to have a fantastic memory. And so we would go through pictures and he had all these, um, you know, documents. I'll interview my dad, my brother. So that's a that's really beautiful thing. It, it um, truly is because there's like this exchange that you get to have with two authors on a book because I'm currently only working with myself, so it's really me in my own head. And I'm like, does that make any sense? But it's really gorgeous to think that you can create this little safe space to not only tell these stories that are challenging, but also um, get that feedback, especially, uh, Kena, I'm not sure how it felt working with um, Susan, because I know she's a writing teacher on top of it all. So I'm sure she, she brought out her red pen and was like. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep up with her. And she would just write all over your page and across things. And <laughs> at first you feel offended and think it's not good. Oh my gosh. And, and then I'm really curious though, what Ken, I mean, what Susan learned from Kenan with regards to his whole experience, was there ever an experience that kind of stood out to you like, wow, I never thought about that that way, or wow, is there anything that really stuck out to you as you became more exposed to his perspective? And there was one story that's central to his writing, and also I was working on a book called The Forgiveness Tour, where I was interviewing people who um, they were wronged and the wrong was never righted and they never got the apology they wanted. And I had a Holocaust survivor who I spoke to and I asked Kenan because in Bosnia, when he told me, you know, we, we learned all the whole story of what happened in Yugoslavia in 1993. But so the Christian Orthodox Serbs who started the war and basically were responsible for 300,000 people dead, they never lost the war. They never apologized. There were never any reparations. And so that was a big question in both of the books, both of, both of the books about his story and also my story. How do you move on? How do you forgive? And even how is there an emotional arc? Because he was just pissed off. So the thing <laughs> is, the, still like 30, 20 years later, and who wouldn't be because it you know, uprooted his family, killed so many people. So the one thing that stood out to me the most was for the Bosnia list, the adult memoir, he wrote a list of all the people who hurt his family who we wanted to avenge. So his teacher who held a gun to his head and his best friends that, uh, that betrayed him and there were 12. And he said, there's no emotional arc at all. It's never, you know, he's never gonna forgive. But then I asked him at one point after he told me the whole story, could you do me a favor and write a list of the Serbs who helped your family survive? And at first he said, I could count them on one finger. And I said, no, you told me somebody gave you food and somebody helped you do fake ID to get you guys out of there. And there was a bus driver. So I said, would you write a list for me? And he wrote a list and it was 12. Mm -hmm. And throughout his mother always said to him, there's good in all people and bad in all people. So when that happened, we both were like, oh my God, there's our arc. And he, you know, and, and so he could forgive the people. I mean, there were people who helped save his family so he could forgive those. So that was really central to an emotional arc for both books and also for my own writing about, you know, forgiveness. Uh, that fascinated me. It's really interesting because, you know, when you're writing about these challenging topics, even when you're writing about them in a funny way, I think Sadia and I have spoken many times, it was important to have a co-author because there were times when 
you know, there were parts of our book that were uncomfortable or that I was worried that my family was going to respond negatively to. And having somebody, having a co-author like Sadia and friend who said, no, you know, like you have to tell that story. You have to go there. It's, you have to write that story and, um, and to share that encouragement. It was a really important part of the process. And it sounds like uh, Kenan and Susan, it was for you as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I know we don't have too much more time and there's a very important question here on my end because I am a lover of food and part of my book has food involved because I think food is one of those things that really brings us home ultimately. It's a huge part of our identities. So I have a absolutely random question that I think would be a, a great place to open up afterwards. Um, if you had to have a celebration meal your biggest celebration meal that would make you feel at home and safe and wonderful and comfortable that you would invite us all for, what would it be? <laughs> Kenan and I, we had, we called it a book mitzvah, uh, a <laughs> Jewish book mitzvah when Bosnia list came out. And Kenan, what kind of food did you get that was so delicious? We, Bosnia too, it's a lot of uh, phyllo and stuffed pastry with meat and cheese and, and spinach and there were beef mint sausages. Sabape? Sabape, yeah. We went to, I went to a place in the story of Coons when I was living at the time and I got like a couple hundred of them. And so I just delivered everything. So it was a very Balkan themed uh, food festival. And then I got the, the um, Second Avenue Deli. So we had like um, Box, chopped right. liver and lox and bagels. So it was, uh, it, was a, it was a big mix. Laura and Sadia, how about, how about y'all? Let's hear it. Wow. I mean, like, I, how can you choose one? You have to have, like, many, have a spread, many have a spread, have a spread. A party, right? <laughs> we actually, because of the pandemic, we were going to, Sadi was going to come to Maryland for our launch and we were going to have, like, a party with yeah. food wow. and um, give people a chance to try some of the Pakistani dishes in the book. And so I think, Sadi, at some point, we're going to have that party. <laughs> I'm yeah. invited. I'm invited. Put me on the invite list. <laughs> Even if I just have to come virtually and do it on my own. Yeah, yeah. Our book is basically about food. There's such a strong food theme. It's it's all over the book. There every um, every section that has a new um, cooking club class is, is doing a new recipe. And so it's really hard to choose. I think if I had a party or if I had a gathering with just like my favorite food foods. I would, um, I don't know, biryani would be on the top of my list just because it's more of a festive dish. That's not something you cook all the time, or at least not me. I don't know, there must be like cool people who actually <laughs> cook biryani all the time. <laughs> that's not me, but it's, and that is in the book also, that's like their last dish, but, um, that's kind of a celebratory meal, but um, that's really good. That and also, by it. the way, during the war for 10 months stuck in, um, in his house, they couldn't get food and they were really yeah. rationing food and Kenan was... His family was came close to starving, so um, food was such a huge, you know, for him. And he remembered, like, what, what was it when you went to Vienna? Um, it, you were, what were you eating? The pastries, right, Kenan? A lot of pastries, uh, things filled with peach jam, strawberry jam, mm. hot chocolate. Mm. He actually told me one one specific detail that stayed with me that changes the way that I treat visitors to my home, which is he they his family when they first got to America, they were staying with a, a, a nice woman who would feed them, but she would take out, she'd make them chicken sandwiches and she'd put it on the table. And then he went to um, someone else's home, uh, Reverend Don Hodges and Katie. And when they walked in, Katie opened the refrigerator and said, here, Kenan, take anything you want. What do you want? And as a kid, he was like, oh my God, look at all this food, especially after they'd been starving for a year. And he, he loved the choices, the fact that he had so many choices. And that was so minor, but it made such a big difference to him in the book that now whenever I have visitors or people, especially people from other places, instead of me taking out the food, I will either hand them a menu or I'll open my refrigerator and I'll say, anything you want, what do you want? Especially kids. And I never would have thought about how, what, what an impact, what a difference that could make from someone that maybe doesn't have, hasn't had as much food or doesn't have as many choices. So I thought that was a really important moment. And, and even for a foodie, because um, in my book, my mother bribes me with food to do everything. That's how she got my, my, my sister and my brother and myself to move like across the country. She'd be like, I'll get you this or that. And it literally worked because I really love food. 
So when I started seeing the food theme in your stories, and also when I saw the struggle that Kenan went through where food became a problem, I was like, wow, this is, food is such a, it's just such a, a, a it's so, it's a part of everybody's culture. And I'm really happy that that's something that you got to share in your book. Um, so I guess now it's time to start opening up for audience questions. So shall we just go right into the audience questions? Are everybody ready for them? Let's get a thumbs up at least. <laughs> All right, everybody's ready to go. All right, let's see what we got. And by the way, audience, do not be shy. I'm very sorry that I can't see everybody, but good night and hi. Um, and and if, if you want to talk to me, put a question in the in the in the in the question in the Q and A box, and it will force me to be able to see you and say hi to you. So Katie G sent a question. She asked, while each of you were working with your writing partner, did you learn anything about each other's culture that you didn't know? Wow. Laura, we learned a lot about each other. Um, we uh, talked a lot on the phone um, about the, the scenes we were going to write. You know, um, we were talking about experiences and deciding should we put that in there, should we not? And so many of our discussions just I mean we we hardly knew each other when we started right it was just kind of like hey let's write a book together because we seem like a good fit and then by the end of the book um we were really good friends so we learned a lot about each other's cultures and how we do things and some of those conversations ended up in the book mm -hmm. because they were just too good to not go in the book Right. Yeah, and it's sometimes it's little things. There's a scene in our book where the girls are at the mall and they're talking about um, piercing, ear piercing, and how that can be a cultural or religious thing for some families. And that totally just came out of a, a convert. I don't even know if the if the idea for the mall scene came first or if we were just having a conversation and shooting the breeze. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll I mean, the Halloween scene. And yeah. So many scenes that we we were talking as people getting to know each other, and then they just were like, "Wow, I didn't know you do that." And a lot of it was, "Oh, well, I do that as a Muslim, and Laura does that as a Jewish person. How cool is that? We have to show that because our book is all about interfaith. I don't know. Dialogue seems like more adultish, but you know, interfaith I think friendships. One of my favorites is that um, there's a there's an overlap between the girls that that uh, Elizabeth's family has the ketubah, which is the Jewish marriage contract. It's usually done in beautiful calligraphy displayed in their house. And Sarah has uh, verses from the Quran done in calligraphy displayed in her house. And the girls really notice that, oh, that's, you know, that's something you wouldn't see everywhere, but it feels, there's something about it that feels comfortable and familiar to me, even though that's not my exact culture. Yeah, at one point with Kenan and I, I, I'm trying to remember he was, there were sayings that his mother would say that my mother would say, and he grew up, you know, in uh, he, Muslim in Bosnia, um, you know, and he was much younger than I was. And I grew up in West Bloomfield, Michigan in a Jewish family. And, and there were times when it seemed like we were from the same family. Like when his mother would say there are good and bad in all people, or his father would say, whatever work you do, you have to be the best. And it was just sort of astounding how, they thought the same, you know, it was almost like from the same family. Ken, did you remember you, you, you got close to my dad too. Yeah, I remember when we went to uh, Grand Rapids and West Bloomfield, Michigan to do a, um, with a book talk, with a presentation. And I felt such a home. I just felt like one of the grandkids in mom's house. And really, she really treated me like um, one of your own. And I realized how close the family was and is, uh, still is obviously. And it reminded me of days when I was little when I used to go to grandma's house, you know, the fridge opens up, they feed you, here's a towel, you, you know, you can get in the pool, you need anything, and they're constantly on you, you know, make sure you're happy and you're, you know, there's nothing you need, you don't miss anything. There was also a fascinating connection with my dad because we have a Holocaust background from my family and he's a history buff. So, and he was, I was wondering why he loved the, um, the books with Kenan so much. And at one point I realized it was because it was about his family, not my family, because he didn't like what I wrote about us. But there was such an amazing connection. He immediately connected the Holocaust in Europe to what was going on in Bosnia. And which in also- one second, he, he, he just completely got it. So this person has a question that really brings it to um, another topic. How do you feel your story changed by having dual narrative and co-author situation? And I just think, um, but having co-author, especially of different culture, religion, it bridges the two cultures um, because the evil is universal and really opens up the dialogue for understanding each other's pain. 
So, I mean, that's really also a message of the book. A lot of people have, you know, asked Susan and I, well, how do you feel what's going on with the world with, you know, um, conflict in the Middle East? And we always discuss the importance and of just talking, having a conversation. And I think one point Susan said that she feels that we can call this book a Jewish Muslim book of healing about Christians that saved you know, my family. That's Actually, uh, during the recent um, war, Kenan and I decided to put out a statement, which was uh, with, with Israel and, and Gaza, we put out a statement, which is that um, basically just that we wish peace and reconciliation for both sides. And it was really, um, it was emotional. We got nice responses from both sides, you know, because it was, it was so fraught, but we, he and I have such an understanding that we both felt for each other's people. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really very beautiful. Um, uh, there, I'm going to go to another question. Um, this question is from Sam O. And Sam O wants to know, are you all hoping to write together again? And are you working on anything new? So those are two big questions. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Let's hear from Laura. We haven't heard from Laura in a while. Um, not right now. Saudi and I don't have any plans to write together. Um, I have a short story coming out in an anthology that's um, all of the stories have to do with bar and bat mitzvahs. It's coming out next year. It's called Coming of Age. And I'm developing my story, which is about a girl named Danny Carrot uh, <laughs> into, a, into a middle grade novel. So that's what I'm working on. And always writing poetry because that's my jam. Nice. And Sadia? Yes, I'm going to show everyone my book that's coming out next month. Oh my gosh, I can't even believe it's going to be out in a month. Yusuf Azim is not a hero. This is a middle grade novel about the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And wow. it is um, it's about a boy who is um, excited about starting middle school, going through um, to a robotics competition. Um, but things in a small Texas town seem to be getting scarier and scarier as 9-11's 20th anniversary approaches. Um, there's a white supremacist group in the town that's riling people up. And um, as things get worse and worse, there's um, violence, there's um, racial profiling, there's a lot of negative stuff. But um, he kind of starts reading this journal of his uncle's that's from 20 years ago. So you have like a dual timeline almost where there's a story that's going on from 9-11 and then Yusuf's story um, that's kind of connected and he learns that 20 years have passed but a lot of things have not changed um, and he has to finally um, stand up and say something and do something even though everyone's telling him to sit down and not be a hero he realizes that someone needs to take that job. So um, <laughs> having said that, it's uh, uh, timely, but also a very kind of, um, I don't wanna say controversial, but more like a sensitive topic for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. It's a big um, anniversary, 20 years. I can't believe 20 years have passed, oh my gosh. Um, and I hope that this book kind of tries to bring people together. Um, so, you know, I hope you all check it out when it comes out on the 7th of September. Yes, Audio so was, was completely ready for that question. She's like, by the way, because it's like have, time. Amazing. I have in the last month done this yeah, speech about a thousand it. times already in front of booksellers. I have made videos over videos. So yeah, I can now say it in my speech. Well, <laughs> and the cover is looking write, like a Harry uh, Potter feel. And I love Harry Potter. So if they're already in I see exactly what they were doing. You there. are like, very right. That's the first thing I thought of, but it's not at all magical, but um, I like it. And I it like had it. a happy ending despite all the bad things that happened. There was hope and um, a message of hope and, and a way to move forward for all of us. So yeah, well, yeah you sorry, that something. sounded very uh, practiced, but it actually is very practiced. <laughs> yeah, so I was lucky that I, um, I was able to write the forgiveness tour where I wrote about Kenan as an adult from my point of view. And then I have a new book coming out because uh, I uh, teach writing. So it's called um, The Book Bible, uh, How to Sell Your Manuscript No Matter What Genre Without Going Broke or Insane. <laughs> and interestingly, Kenan and I have actually talked about, can we take the story further as a YA novel? Because what happened was when we finished, um, when we finished World in Between, there was actually a lot more that we wanted to get in, um, including Kenan actually mentioned that his mother got sick and his dad got sick. But the editor, not only was it too long, but the editor said, 
you know, let's stop it at this place where everything's okay with the family because they went through so much by, you know, escaping Bosnia, they get, you know, the war, they got to Vienna, then they finally got to America, they finally got a decent home. So the editor felt like this is a good place to stop for middle grade. But then as he's 13, 14, 15, there were horrible things that happened to his family that that he survived. So we've, we've, abs we've absolutely talked about, is there a YA? Um, Kenan, so that, Kenan, I think that would be um, from age 13 to 18 or 19. So you, you, your family actually went through a lot more trauma um, in America, right? You're uh, muted. Yeah, my mom's cancer came, ba uh, came back. We moved like three more times. And then um, I think I was freshman in college when my dad had, ended up getting an aneurysm. So, so, so we're, de we're debating if there's a way to, you know, continue the story of what happened. And again, one of the things that we think is so important is that, you know, to understand immigrants or refugees is, especially if they come from war or trauma is you don't just move here and everything's fine, you know? And so really for so many years, his family went through, I mean, even just recently when he lost his father, you know, they went through so much and it took so long to be able to, um, you know, become an American citizen and feel safe here. So, so we think maybe there's a, um, a YA book in it. Well, I think the last question we have, and it's wonderful we got to get through all of the questions, but the last question we have is about, I guess this person is looking for a little bit of drama. They want to know about the drama. So Lee Malone wants to know um, if either team used veto power, like was there something about the other narrative that you didn't want in the book and you said, nope, and the other, the co-author had to follow along. Is there any examples? I have one funny example. <laughs> I have one funny example, which is, so Kenan would sometimes tell me a story from his point of view. And, you know, I've been a writer for many decades and actually have a poetry degree. So I would put it in my own language sometimes or different language. So at one point he was talking, he was talking about how it sucked that he was a refugee at 12 because he never got to do anything cool in his country because his brother was 18. So his brother had got to drive, went to bars, dated women, and he never got to because he was 12. So I wrote the line that said, I never kissed a girl from home. And he hated that line. He was like, <laughs> and it embarrassed him. And I was like, but it's a beautiful Aww. line and it's true. Mm -hmm. So he hates when I tell the story, but so we kept, <laughs> we kept it. And um, after, after the book came out, um, after the Bosnia list came out, a lot of women contacted him and would you tell them, the, would you finish the story about the best one, Kenan, who contacted you? Wait, you're, um, you're muted. You're muted. I have a hard time hearing, but I think I heard what you, what you asked. Well. Who did you meet from, from the book? After my wife. I met my wife. Don't tell them the story. <laughs> well, you like to tell the story. You love it. That's why I don't, I don't tell the story. You do. So. <laughs> You love telling the story. So the best I always see the smile, yeah. and I always know it's coming. So <laughs> it's such a beautiful ending. Yeah, go ahead. So the best email he got was a very subtle, um, instant message that said, "I love your book, and thank you for speaking out for my people." And um, no picture, nothing. So he looked her up, and and I remember he told me, "She's gorgeous." And she's in Sarajevo, and he'd never been to the capital of Sarajevo. Yeah, so he, he told me to get on a plane. What am I waiting for? Because oh, he's falling <laughs> on FaceTime. So I'm like, get on a plane. And the coolest thing is he'd never been to Sarajevo. So all of a sudden, I get a text saying he's driving with his Sarajevo girlfriend, Mirala, to take her to a bar to meet her family to propose. So it was like everything he didn't get at 12. He's driving, he's in Sarajevo, he's at the bar, he's proposing. So um, so she's here now. That's really, really, really beautiful. It's like a modern love story. Well, Susan's now the the, the byline Bible, the, uh, how to teach you how to find love, teach you how to write a book, teach you how to sell <laughs> articles, like what else well, you got? The best that he said to me, which I love, was that he said, um, by facing down his past, he found his future. Nice, that's so really, really, that. really, really, really gorgeous. and. All of these books, uh, or both of these books, and all and, and your stories, and just thank you so much for sharing your stories. But they're so hopeful and so like so tangible, and for 
for kids of color, I think the, the really last question I, I, I want to ask personally, I just really want to know what you want your readers to take away from this, especially these young adults. Uh, some of these kids may be immigrant kids. Like, what are, is the biggest message in your story that you really want these readers to take away? Well, I would say to teach uh, not only teachers, but American kids about genocide, teach the children how to treat war survivors and immigrants better. That's in a nutshell. That's our message. Laura, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think that was something that we also just wanting um, adults and kids to, to have empathy for first generation American kids, um, but also for, for me and for Sadia, one of the things that was really important to us to get across in this book is that um, sometimes you have to work at friendship and that, um, you know, the kids this age, the middle grade age, that they can learn how to nurture friendships. They can learn how to make a conscious effort and work through the issues that might come up in a friendship. And, um, and that was an important part of both our experiences as friends and co-authors, but also something that we wanted to get across um, for the kids who might read the book. Beautiful. Right. That was wonderful. Um, I have a quick question for each group. This is um, very light, but for um, Saudi and Laura, the ice cream, like how did that recipe come about? Was that truly like on the spot? Was it a Everyone thing? Everyone wants to know about the ice cream. I swear <laughs> we should like put it up on our website. This is how it came about. Well, it was, it was Laura's idea. So she gets to tell the story. Um, I just, I think that we actually were talking about doing a recipe with the um, paratas because um, I'd seen them on, on videos and I was like, they look so amazing. Um, and Sadia just said, you know, Laura, no, we can't make s'mores with, with that, which is, it's, it's also in the book. Um, Sarah says that this will make a big mess. So of course, then they make a big mess. Um, I don't remember exactly how we came up with ice cream. I think that maybe ice cream itself was Sadia's suggestion. Um, and I wanted to try the Earl Grey um, recipe and so we just, you know, we added the, the a Pakistani sweet, the halva, the milk halva to it. And I have made it. It is delicious. It, the halva takes a long time to make, but it's worth it. It's like, um, it's like fusion cookies and cream. Very cool. And by the way, Laura made every single thing in that book, which is a lot of things. She would not put the the final dish in the book that was the only kind not veto power we didn't have that with our because it was her story and my story we didn't get to really tell each other you can't write this but um she would not include a recipe until she made it and it tasted good and her family loved it and then she'd be like okay we will put this <laughs> Wow, really test tried it there. That's impressive. Um, and then Kenan, I was curious, do you still play soccer or do you still draw or any of those hobbies still continue on? No, when I uh, came, I think in high school, I was uh, in a, like a high school contest. I think mm -hmm. came in like a second place. I drew a portrait, portrait of someone. And then we ended up moving to another town. So then I had to become cool and try to make more friends. And so I joined all, all these different sports teams. So. Okay. I think the first time I drew since I was 16, um, I was with my wife in Sarajevo last January mm. and I took a little pad, a piece of paper and I went on the balcony and it was cold and I drew like a, like a landscape and I still have it here. So that's amazing. So it's an idea. It was really relaxing and you know, it brought back some of the, the thumb and finger muscles. But soccer wise, uh, ever, ever since I became a physical therapist, I um, seen a lot of young adults getting injured, especially those who haven't played in a while. And every now, every, now, every now and then they come in and say, oh, I haven't played in so many years and the torn ankle muscle, torn ligament, torn shoulder. So that really scared me. So I stayed away from it. Gotcha. All right. Well, good advice from physical therapist, <laughs> of course. Um, all right. Thank you everyone again for uh, joining us tonight. And Tiffany, thank you so much for moderating. Um, thank you, Kenan, Susan, Tadia, Laura. Um, and thank you viewers for your great questions. Um, and again, joining us tonight. We do want to remind everyone that you can still click uh, the links in the chat to purchase the books highlighted tonight. 
Um, both excellent, excellent reads. Um, can't say enough. Uh, you can check out our website for even more titles by the authors. And as an independent bookstore, uh, we of course appreciate your support. Uh, you can definitely check out our website for updated event listings and follow our children and teens department on social media under at kids and pros. And that about wraps up our time tonight. So we hope you enjoyed hearing from these amazing authors and we hope you have a 